Hi, listeners. Just a quick reminder that starting in August, Cults is moving exclusively to Spotify. Being a part of the Spotify family means that we're able to bring you more in-depth and exciting content than ever before. And we can't wait for you to check it out. Mystery, manipulation, murder. Don't miss any of it. All you have to do is download the Spotify app for free and search Cults. Give it a follow and start enjoying. That's it. We can't thank you enough for listening to Cults. And we look forward to seeing you exclusively on Spotify in August. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. As 24-year-old Dawn Godman sat in the passenger seat of her date's car, her stomach fluttered with excitement. She hadn't been out with a man in a very long time, and it had taken two hours for her to get dressed. Dawn was still regaining her confidence after a tough divorce. She had felt so much pain, it had driven her to attempt suicide. But with the guidance of the LDS Church, she had survived, thrived even. The Church had also brought her date, Taylor Helser, into her life, and now into his car for an evening together. Taylor looked into her eyes and caressed her cheek, She couldn't believe someone like him, so confident and charming, would be interested in her. Therefore, it caught Dawn off guard when Taylor told her that he had selected her to help him in a special mission. Taylor confessed that he was a warrior prophet, ordained by God, destined to wage a war against Satan. Dawn maintained eye contact as she listened to Taylor describe his life's work. He was trying to save humanity, and he desperately needed her help. For a moment, she was too shocked to speak. Then she asked, What do you need me to do? Taylor's voice was full of love as he replied, My status as a prophet makes my actions and my followers' actions above the law. Any act that serves the greater good no matter how violent, is righteous. Dawn didn't understand. Taylor clarified, we can do anything we want. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a ParCast original. Every Tuesday, we take a look at a cult's practices, their leader, and their followers. Today we're taking a deep dive into the Children of Thunder, a short-lived but murderous cult led by Taylor Helser in 2000. Taylor believed that God spoke to him, commanding that he would save the world from Satan by becoming the leader of the LDS Church. At ParCast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoyed today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of Parcast's other shows, on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. Taylor Helzer believed that he alone could lead the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and that any act in service of that end goal was a justified one. In his mind, he was destined to defeat Satan and spread peace and love in the world. In the summer of 2000, Taylor led his small band of followers on an eight-day spree in Northern California. It started with extortion and ended in the deaths of five people. In part one, we'll explore Taylor's first experiences with the LDS Church and how his mother's influence steered him away from mental stability and into delusion. In part two, we'll follow investigators down the bloody path Taylor and his Children of Thunder left in their wake and see how a cult deprogrammer helped turn one of Taylor's followers against him. Glenn Taylor Helser was born in Lansing, Michigan on July 26, 1970, into a strict LDS church family. His father, Jerry, was an insurance salesman, while his mother, Karma, stayed at home. 
The family moved around a bit for Jerry's work. And during this nomadic time, Taylor's younger brother and sister, Justin and Heather, were born. In 1981, when Taylor was 11, the family finally set down roots in Burlingame, California, about 20 miles outside of San Francisco. However, two years later, money troubles forced them to move in with Karma's parents. Karma's father, Doyle Sorensen, was also extremely devoted to the LDS faith. Along with leading the family in intense readings from the Book of Mormon, Doyle would often recount the time he was visited by Jesus Christ. Not a voice, not a ghostly apparition, a flesh and blood form of God's only Son. Doyle told the Helsers that he and Jesus spoke for hours on the front lawn. Jerry and Karma took these visions and voices from God very seriously and taught their children to as well. Taylor, therefore, became very religious early in life. He spoke about his faith to others and quickly became a prominent member of his local LDS church. In 1986, when Taylor was 16, he became a priest, a common designation for young men that the church believe are gifted. This status gave him the ability to baptize others and administer the holy sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Later that same year, he received his patriarchal blessing, a rare designation that is considered sacred among members. The patriarch who administered this blessing told Taylor, the Lord will reveal to you his mind and his will, both in a general way and in a detailed and specific way. You may feel his guidance and his presence, and he will give you answers to your questions and to your prayers, and will give you specific instructions in how to proceed in some of the more difficult matters with which you may deal. Shortly after the blessing, Taylor told his parents that he was hearing voices. Karma explained to him that this was the literal voice of God and encouraged him to follow his instructions. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. The oral hallucinations that Taylor reported hearing were very likely early signs of paranoid schizophrenia, a type of mental illness that prevented his thoughts and reality from being in sync. According to the American Psychiatric Association, most people with schizophrenia are not dangerous or violent, and with proper treatment, most symptoms will greatly improve. However, karma's encouragement for Taylor to listen to these voices instead of seeking any kind of medical advice most likely not only exacerbated the symptoms, but also gave them credence. Because he was so spiritually advanced, karma allowed 16-year-old Taylor to drop out of high school in 1986 and earn his diploma through independent study. She also instructed his younger siblings, Justin and Heather, to defer to their gifted brother and listen to whatever he said. Karma's adoration for Taylor gave him a feeling of religious importance and reinforced the idea that he was more special than others. It may have planted the seeds for Taylor to develop narcissistic tendencies. Doctors Brian D. Johnson and Lori Birdall, authors of Warning Signs, wrote, Typical childhood self-centeredness must change to pave the way to mental health in adulthood. To grow up able to function well in families and society, kids must gradually gain both the ability to see other people's viewpoints and empathy for other people's suffering. At 17, Taylor enlisted in the National Guard. Many members of the LDS Church believe that apocalyptic events will predate the second coming of Jesus Christ, and Taylor wanted to be prepared for such an event. He was transferred to a station in Utah in 1988, and it was here that some of the unit members exposed Taylor to drinking, cursing, and the idea of premarital sex for the first time, all vices that were widely disavowed by the church. Though he was no longer under karma's watchful eye, Taylor did not succumb to these temptations. Instead, he used the opportunity to preach against these sins to the service members around him. Speaking to these small groups of soldiers would be his first foray into ministry. He quickly discovered he had a talent for reaching the hearts and minds of others. In 1989, 19-year-old Taylor left the National Guard to go on a two-year mission trip for the LDS Church, a common practice for young church members. That summer, he was ordained as a church elder so he could bring the gospel to others. 
Taylor was sent to a prominent area just north of Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. LDS missionaries had never been sent there before. Taylor's local church leaders were trusting the missionary group to represent them well in this uncharted place. Charismatic to strangers and passionate about his faith, Taylor was a natural missionary. He had been looked up to at home by both parents and siblings. But this was the first time in his life he had been idolized by a large group of strangers. It was a feeling he would not soon forget. At night, Taylor devoutly studied the religious doctrine he preached to the masses. But after a time, the voices in Taylor's head that he called spirit led him to some strange interpretations of the scripture. He believed that the last days, signaling the arrival of Jesus, were closer than they knew. When he told his fellow missionaries about this, they brushed him off. But Taylor's beliefs became his obsession. He compulsively read the Book of Mormon and spent late night hours writing in his journal about his gifts. In one entry, he wrote, quote, I've been feeling the fruits of spirit. It is impossible to turn my mind off. I've never felt the spirit of the Holy Ghost so strongly before. Taylor's nightly notions of apocalyptic end times started to seep into his missionary work during the day. After a few months, he was sharing some of his more radical ideas to the masses, veering off the very specific curriculum laid out by the LDS Church. He told them of a post-apocalyptic landscape where technology would be a useless tool and survivors would adopt a fortress mentality. In this world, bands of people would rely on survivalist skills and be shepherded by warrior prophets. These warriors would protect the members of the church, defending the people and faith against some sort of unseen foe. As Taylor described these futuristic visions of the world, he clearly saw himself as one of these warrior prophets. Throughout Taylor's childhood, his mother and church leaders reinforced the idea that he had a significant religious destiny. Taylor felt like he finally knew what it was. Eventually, he took it upon himself to warn the mission president about what was coming. But his assertions were dismissed as paranoid delusions, and Taylor left their meeting shocked that this man was considered an adequate spiritual leader. Not one to be deterred, Taylor wrote to church leaders at a higher level. He received the same scornful response. As Taylor vented to his peers, he oscillated between accusing the church leaders of knowing the end was coming and refusing to reveal it, and saying that they weren't qualified to hold their positions because they couldn't recognize the truths he told them. He found it frustrating that the second coming was just around the corner and he was the only one paying attention. He believed he had more moral divinity than anyone else in the LDS Church and that he alone should lead the millions of congregants. By the time Taylor left Brazil at age 21, he had completely rejected the authority of the church leaders in favor of the voice in his head, which he called spirit, and believed was the word of God. He wrote, quote, I can't disobey the slightest whispering of spirit. He returned to Burlingame, California in 1991. His mother, Karma, said she could recognize the holy change in her son, and she knew exactly how to cement his transformation. Karma signed Taylor up to take a group awareness workshop seminar called Impact Training. It would help him overcome his limitations and fully realize his destiny. But instead of helping him to better understand himself, the workshop gave Taylor the skill set he needed to dominate and control everyone around him. Coming up, we'll see how Taylor gained the tools of a master manipulator. Every so often, something so impactful happens, it has the power to capture the attention of a whole country. An event so deadly or dumbfounding, it has no choice but to live on in infamy. Hi, Parcasters. It's Ashley Flowers, and I'm exposing the most sinister cases from the darkest corners of the globe in my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, come along as I guide you on a wicked world tour. 15 different countries, 15 infamous crimes. Take a trip to Iceland, where six people confessed to a murder that never actually happened. Journey to Mexico, where a Lucha Libre wrestler moonlights as a serial killer. 
and travel to New Zealand where two friends hatch a deadly plan to become famous. Each episode of International Infamy explores the twists and turns of a notoriously high-profile case, zeroing in on the cultural details which make the crime unique to its location, and explaining why it couldn't have happened anywhere else. Follow my new Spotify original from ParCast, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers, and catch a new episode every week. Listen free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the story. In 1991, 21-year-old Taylor Helzer returned to Burlingame, California, after a two-year mission trip serving the LDS Church. During that time, Taylor became convinced that God had revealed truths to him. The voice in his head he called Spirit told him that the last days were nigh, and only Taylor could save the church from the forces of evil. Karma Helzer had encouraged her son's divine communication since it began at age 16. With his destiny revealed, she wanted to do whatever she could to help, encouraging Taylor to sign up for a group awareness workshop seminar called Impact Training. Group awareness training websites use buzzwords and vague phrasing like, put your dreams into action and awaken the trainer, teacher, and leader in you. In reality, the four-day seminar was a tutorial for Taylor on how to mentally break a person. We don't know the details of Taylor's specific experience, but the methods of group awareness seminars are now widely regarded as brainwashing techniques. In typical seminars, participants confess their darkest secrets to trainers, who then use the information to verbally assault them. Nothing was off limits, and trainers were quick to target things like financial problems, physical appearance, and feelings of inadequacy. Next, participants were instructed to give each other feedback on what they perceived as negative personality traits amongst each other. The trainers used music and lighting to enhance the mood, and participants were often deprived of sleep. They wanted to mentally exhaust them until all of their barriers were gone. Trainers told participants that they couldn't reach their inner child and realize their full potential until they had been fully broken down. They played games that pit them against each other, like deciding who would be allowed on the only lifeboat if the ship they're on is sinking. It made participants consider if their life was worth saving or not. For someone like Taylor, who was confident and charismatic, it was effortless to sail to the top of the group. It reinforced everything he knew was great in himself. Another core principle in impact training is the notion that there is no right and wrong, there are only results. Taylor latched onto this concept, and it would inform his decision-making for the rest of his life. He left with a renewed sense of purpose and a reinforced notion that the beliefs and ideas Spirit revealed in Brazil were correct. He alone knew of the coming end times. He alone was meant to lead the LDS Church. He alone could save them. Once back home, Taylor was still the friendly and likable figure he had always been, just more religiously oriented than ever before. He began dating a woman named Anne, one of his classmates from Ignacio Valley High School. Taylor found her attractive and enjoyed her company. But there was one problem. Anne was not a member of the LDS Church. Leaders preach interfaith marriage, and Taylor did not want a romance with Anne to affect his spiritual quest. It wasn't long before Taylor persuaded Anne to join the LDS Church. They went on their first date right after she was baptized. In the spring of 1993, 23-year-old Taylor married Anne. They moved in together, and it was in these initial weeks of cohabitation that he got his first taste of sin. Taylor fixated on cable TV, something his parents had never allowed in their home. He frequently stayed up all night to watch pornography on the late-night channels, unable to get enough of it. Soon he was begging Anne to bring some of the things he watched into their bedroom, but she wasn't comfortable with this extreme sexual experimentation and rebuked him. Taylor had not been refused anything in his entire life. He became angry with his new wife, lashing out at her. Dr. Susan Krauss Whitborn wrote about different kinds of narcissists and how they react when they don't get their way. She said, quote, 
We might expect that the reaction narcissists choose when things go wrong is full of vitriol, rather than a conscious and deliberate consideration of alternatives. Part and parcel of narcissism, after all, is the sense that you're entitled to get your way. When the fates don't cooperate, you're enraged and you lash out at anyone and everyone, but especially those you identify as thwarting your goals. They had only been married a month when Taylor started staying out late, coming home hours after dinner. When Anne asked where he'd been, Taylor said he had lost track of time at an arcade. But a spark of hope came in the form of Anne's uncle, who worked at the financial investment company Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. He wanted to help the couple have some financial stability, so he offered to show Taylor the ropes, despite Taylor only having completed one semester of college. It was a lucky break. Taylor, who had once peddled religion to non-believers, turned his talents to sales and excelled. His ambition, charisma, and gift of speaking were invaluable traits in this world. What started as a trainee role became a full-time gig. The job provided a distraction from some of Taylor's more extreme ruminations about the second coming. He built a portfolio of around 150 clients that he offered financial advice to, and for a time, life took a normal turn. But after a few short years, Taylor grew tired of the white picket fence life and his taste for vices expanded. He started smoking tobacco and drinking alcohol, both forbidden in the LDS faith. Anne pleaded with him to get help, and in the fall of 1995, 25-year-old Taylor reluctantly agreed to go to therapy. During the sessions, he opened up about his sexual frustrations, telling the therapist that his wife did not want to have sex recently. He thought she was a prude who had tricked him into marriage by pretending to be kinkier than she actually was. The fact that Anne had given birth to their daughter only a few weeks before didn't seem to factor into his equation. Taylor vocalized ideas of satisfying his sexual desires with other women. During one of the sessions, Taylor described a plan to ensure he had sex daily by advertising in Brazil and collecting a pool of 80 to 100 women to sleep with. From there, he could simply whittle it down to 35 and then date one of them at a time. This would help him decide which women he would allow to sign two-year contracts to have sex with him every day. The therapist diagnosed Taylor with narcissistic personality features, but not a full-blown disorder. According to Dr. Alan Schwartz, people with narcissistic personality disorder believe on the surface that they are superior, but behind this mask lies a fragile self-esteem. Taylor had textbook narcissistic qualities, like a sense of entitlement and unreasonable expectations from those around him, but he had never had any issues with his own self-esteem. In Taylor's mind, the therapist's diagnosis was a sign that he didn't understand. Like the LDS leaders in Brazil, the therapist didn't recognize Taylor's interpretations of the world and his rightful place in it. He quit therapy after five sessions and returned to group awareness training. After Taylor quit therapy, he drank more heavily and started smoking marijuana, neglecting his wife and child. While his brother Justin came over for hours to play with his daughter, Taylor barely had time for her. And as his drug and alcohol habits increased, something became apparent to Anne. She trusted Justin more than her husband to be around their baby. By the summer of 1996, Taylor believed his life with Anne was too rudimentary. A warrior prophet, destined to lead his followers during the last days, should not be managing financial portfolios for older couples. Taylor, now 26, moved out and left Anne and his daughter behind, moving in with his brother, loyal Justin, the middle child who was taught by their mother to always follow his brother's wishes. While staying with his brother, Taylor continued to work at Morgan Stanley, but he still resented the job and complained often. Justin simply shrugged and let his brother vent about schemes to collect a disability check instead of working, and his larger plans for the fate of the world and the coming last days. Justin had a steady job at Black Angus Steakhouse and was content with his life. He didn't see any reason for the world to change and honestly hoped it wasn't about to end. But without an off switch on Taylor's musings, Justin was under constant bombardment by his ideas. 
Even if Justin didn't agree with Taylor or even believe him, he'd been instructed his entire life to defer to his brother's authority. After hearing about Taylor's role as a warrior priest day in and day out, he couldn't help but start to internalize those notions as truth. Soon after Taylor moved in, their brothers were joined by a third roommate, their 24-year-old cousin, Shai Hoffman. Shai was diagnosed as bipolar and schizophrenic and had spent time over the years in local and state facilities. Taylor was fascinated by this. As Taylor and Shai got high on the couch together, he mined his cousin for information about schizophrenia. How did other patients at the facility act? What were their mannerisms and behaviors? Taylor explained that he wanted to appear mentally unstable so that he could stop working and pick up a disability check. Shai laughed at some of Taylor's initial attempts to pull off the look. In addition to the disability check scheme, Taylor told Shai he wanted to start an escort service. The notion that he was meant to save the LDS church by becoming its leader had returned to the forefront of his mind. But he acknowledged that carrying out such a goal would require funding. Taylor surmised that an escort service would allow them to raise the money they needed. After all, if he liked sex so much, surely others felt the same way and would pay for it. He would be the brains and shy the muscle. The cable TV shows Taylor watched had shown him that violence was sometimes necessary in this line of work. He asked his cousin if he had ever killed anyone. Shy answered that he hadn't, but Taylor pressed him. Would he be willing to kill? Shai hesitated. Taylor shared the mantra he'd learned in impact training, there is no right or wrong as long as your actions are in service of the greater good. The money raised by the escort service would fund the war against Satan. If Shai had to resort to violence in service of that goal, no one could blame him. With that logic, Shai agreed. They had business cards made for the escort service, but there's no evidence that an actual business materialized. In the meantime, the spring of 1998 brought changes for 28-year-old Taylor. Though he had abandoned his wife, Anne, nearly 18 months prior, the two had not officially divorced. In fact, they had continued to sleep together. This eventually resulted in the birth of their second daughter, but it only added more pressure to the deeply flawed marriage, and they divorced soon after. That summer, at his sister Heather's wedding, Taylor found himself the black sheep of the family for the first time in his life. Divorce was supposed to be an unheard of act in the LDS faith, not to mention drug and alcohol use. Whispers about his smoking and drinking had floated from ear to ear over the last few years. At the wedding, his relatives saw him lighting up with their own eyes. Taylor shared with one of his aunts some of his new philosophies about the moral decay of society and his role as a warrior priest. As he walked away from her, the aunt wondered if Taylor should be seeing a mental health professional. While his aunt wondered, Heather took action. She had seen the changes in her older brother and feared his soul was in danger. Members of the LDS Church are held to a higher standard than others. If they failed to meet those standards, they would be barred from heaven. Heather thought Taylor had willfully turned to a life of sin and that his soul could not be saved. She wrote to church leaders to tell them about Taylor's spiral. She explained how he had divorced his wife, abandoned his daughters, and was drinking and taking drugs. The church excommunicated him. But Taylor shrugged off the dismissal. After all, the LDS leaders had failed to comprehend his warnings of the coming last days. Why should he care if they recognized him as part of the church or not? He would find more deserving followers to lead to salvation. So he turned his attention fully on his first budding disciple, his new girlfriend, Carrie Furman. Taylor met Carrie shortly after his divorce in a diner. He thought the 22-year-old waitress was stunningly beautiful, with long, blonde hair and glowing features. He struck up a conversation with her and asked her out on a date, but she politely refused. Taylor, still in the suit he had worn to the office that day, left behind his business card and credit card, with a note telling Carrie to buy something nice for herself. If Kerry had actually used his credit card for anything expensive, it probably would have been declined. Taylor was anything but financially stable at this time, but she was intrigued by him. 
her last boyfriend had been abusive and her childhood was turbulent as well. Surely this older man was more mature and responsible than the usual crowd of younger men she dated. Taylor's gamble paid off, and Carrie agreed to go out with him. The two complimented each other well at first. He didn't rush into a physical relationship and cried the first time they slept together. Sure, he spoke intensely about religion and the coming last days, but Taylor offered the smitten Carrie things she had never experienced growing up. Touch, eye contact, and unconditional love. Ever charming, ever convincing, Taylor persuaded Carrie to move in with him that summer. Shortly after she moved in, Taylor asked Carrie to help him take a friend to a group awareness seminar. But when they arrived, Taylor presented Carrie with her own overnight bag. He wanted her to take the seminar as well. Carrie protested, but Taylor practically pushed her through the door. Through his own training, Taylor recognized the benefit of breaking a person down mentally and how easy it was to take advantage of them afterward. He knew Carrie had had a rough upbringing and that the seminar would weaken her, allowing her to be exposed to his influence. It was only the first step in a plan to control her. Soon after Carrie returned from the seminar, she complained of a headache and Taylor gave her an aspirin. Carrie not only lost her headache, she started to feel incredible all over. Instead of aspirin, Taylor had given her an ecstasy pill. Soon they were using ecstasy together regularly, attending raves and nightclubs. Between the heavy drug use and the effects of impact training, Taylor took complete control of Carrie's life. She listened to everything he told her. He enlisted her to help him fake a mental breakdown so that he wouldn't have to work at Morgan Stanley anymore. Taylor scheduled a psychiatric evaluation and practiced mimicking behaviors with his cousin Shy to look psychologically unbalanced. Shy gave him notes on the performance, but silently thought that he couldn't really tell what behaviors Taylor was faking. He was manic all the time now. Coming up, Taylor frees himself of his 9-to-5 job and begins enlisting other followers for his crusade. Now, back to the story. In the fall of 1998, 28-year-old Taylor Helzer plotted with his 22-year-old girlfriend, Carrie Furman, to commit fraud. For years, he'd searched for a way to collect disability checks so that he could quit his boring full-time job. Carrie agreed to help him fake a mental breakdown. On September 1st, 1998, Taylor had his first psychiatric appointment with Dr. Jeffrey Kay. He spoke hurriedly about his troubles at work, rapid-fire thoughts that coursed through him during the workday, and the major effect they had on his ability to perform. Dr. K recognized Taylor was in a manic phase and quickly diagnosed him with bipolar disorder. According to Dr. Robert Hirschfeld, those who are going through a manic phase experience high levels of energy, less need to sleep, and sometimes delusions. Taylor, having done his homework, reported all of these symptoms. Dr. K recommended that Taylor take part in an intensive outpatient program that involved group therapy. Ironically, Taylor was not able to handle the medically overseen group therapy with the same ease that he felt during the group awareness seminars. Taylor had felt comfortable in an aggressive environment that broke people down, but he could not handle a safe, positive setting with other patients that were like him. He quit after one session and demanded to be treated by Dr. K one-on-one. -on -one. During the fall and winter of 1998, Taylor met with Dr. K several times. He started a regimen of prescribed drugs that included an anticonvulsant and antipsychotic and lithium. Taylor hated the drugs, but he stomached them so he could collect a disability check. Taylor and Carrie used the money collected from these checks to purchase ecstasy. They frequented the same nightclubs they partied at and were able to sell the pills at a high markup. By this time, Taylor and Carrie's drug use had expanded to cocaine and crystal meth. She was still firmly controlled by his influence. When he told her he wanted to make her a model, Carrie reluctantly agreed to get breast implants. But Taylor made her pay for them. She had to take a second job as a stripper to pay off the loan. Now that Taylor had completely dominated Carrie, he started looking for more recruits. 
During one of the group awareness training sessions he attended, Taylor met an 18-year-old named Lena. At first, Lena hung out with both Taylor and Carrie as friends. But Taylor started seeing more and more of her away from Carrie, and the two became romantically involved. When Taylor was with Lena, she noticed he could never stop talking. She feigned sleep at night, but he continued on for hours without noticing. He was truly manic, and some of the things he said to Lena frightened her. He relentlessly impressed on her the importance of loyalty and told her that if he ever killed someone, Carrie would immediately help him cover it up by cutting up the body. This was too much too fast for Lena, and she broke up with him for good. Taylor was back to square one, looking for another disciple. Shortly after the breakup, Taylor, now 29, faced another setback in his well-laid plans. In the spring of 1999, after six months of treatment, Dr. K decided Taylor was ready to return to work. After finally achieving his dream of disability checks, Taylor would not allow this to happen. Drastic steps had to be taken. Taylor made Carrie call Dr. K and tell him that Taylor was off his antipsychotics because they were reacting badly to a medication for genital warts. Two days later, Taylor walked into an emergency room and asked to be committed. He was hospitalized and allowed to push back his return to work by another six months. Taylor believed that he was outsmarting the doctors and therapists who treated him. In reality, he was showing persistent signs of paranoid schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. His charisma had helped disguise the symptoms of those mental illnesses for most of his life, and his narcissism made him believe he was fooling everyone around him. But in reality, his delusions remained unchecked. Free to live off the disability checks for another six months, Taylor resumed his search for another young woman to groom. In the summer of 1999, Taylor and his brother Justin attended a murder mystery dinner put on by an LDS church group. Though Taylor had been excommunicated by leaders of the church his family attended, he still frequented other temples. The two men, sporting black attire, long hair, and scruffy faces, stood out amongst the clean-cut members of the congregation. No one would approach them. No one, that is, except for 24-year-old Dawn Godman. Dawn met Taylor at a crossroad in her life. The heavyset woman was mercilessly teased by her peers growing up. She had recently gone through a divorce, and it led her to attempt suicide. After the attempt, Dawn searched for anyone who could help get her back on the right path. Help came in the form of a friend who wanted to bring Dawn into the LDS church. She was baptized in February 1997. She landed a job, an apartment, and even a friend. Dawn was just barely back on her feet when she introduced herself to Taylor at the murder mystery dinner. It made her a perfect mark. Taylor used the same techniques on Dawn that he had with Carrie and Lena. He showered her with attention and showed interest in her. Dawn was taken aback by this tall, handsome man who wanted to spend time with her. When he asked to pick her up to hang out, Dawn thought it was their first date. But walking down to his van from her apartment, Taylor announced that he was taking her to a very important event, a group awareness training seminar. Dawn was disappointed, but trusted him from the very beginning. After all, no one else in her life had given her this much attention and care. She bought into the values of the seminar and hung on to Taylor's every word. Don wasn't the only recruit he attracted. Taylor, Justin, and Carrie rented a house in Concord, California, with a man named Brandon Davids and his girlfriend, Olivia Embry. He made them both attend the group awareness training seminar as well, and revealed to the group that he would soon be launching his own seminar called Transform America. He started to test their loyalty, asking them questions like, if he were to steal a car or rob a diner, would they still support him in the coming last days? Taylor discovered that his manipulation of others was only effective when he was able to show them special, individualized attention. This made it hard to control multiple people simultaneously all under one roof. More and more, he leaned on spirit the voice in his head, to give them authoritative commands. 
When one of the followers criticized Taylor's drug use, he threatened her in the third person while talking to Spirit. She cut Taylor out of her life soon after. At the end of 1999, with Taylor's attention divided among the multiple followers, Carrie slipped into a depression. She had worked off the loan for her breast enhancement surgery and wanted to quit her job as a stripper, but Taylor would not have it. Instead, he pressed her to recruit some of her co-workers for the escort service he still hoped to get off the ground. Carrie resisted this plan, but she was unable to free herself from him. She used drugs heavily as a form of escape and barely left the house other than for work. At a certain point, she contemplated suicide. Taylor was disappointed with her listless behavior, but he was encouraged when she told him she wanted to try modeling. To help her, Taylor directed Carrie in a photo shoot on her driveway, and she submitted the photos to Playboy. But Taylor could see that he was losing Carrie mentally. She was no longer the reliable partner who had helped him sell ecstasy and fool the shrink. Not to be discouraged, he turned to his next most loyal female follower, Dawn. He took Dawn out for a drive, parking in the lot of a nearby LDS temple. She eagerly accepted him as the savior for the coming last days, and he told her the details of his plan to become the leader of the church. Once they had enough money to travel to Brazil, Taylor would recruit street orphans and train them as assassins. Once trained, he would smuggle the children into the United States to kidnap the top 15 leaders of the LDS church. Taylor conceded matter-of-factly that some of the orphans and church leaders would die in the fray. But it was all in the name of the greater good, and therefore a blameless action. Once captured, he would smuggle the church leaders back to Brazil. There, he would force them to write letters recommending Taylor as the new head of the church. Then he would be free to fulfill his destiny. Dawn was rapt, believing every word, ready to do whatever was necessary. The rest of his followers were not as convinced. At the beginning of 2000, Brandon and Olivia moved out of the house they had rented with Taylor, Justin, and Carrie. Soon after they left, Taylor came home to find Carrie strung out in bed. She hadn't moved for hours, and Taylor saw no use for her anymore. He suggested she go home for a while to recover. She quickly left, sensing an opportunity to escape for good. She would never be controlled by him again. Taylor brushed off her departure. He had Justin. He had Dawn. He did not need a pathetic waste of a human holding him back any longer. However, in the spring of 2000, he heard that Carrie was selected to be a Playboy centerfold and had moved out to L.A. to be a professional model. He was furious. Taylor believed he was completely responsible for her success and that she had betrayed him by leaving on the eve of her greatest accomplishment. With Carrie and the others gone, Taylor and Justin couldn't afford to stay. Taylor moved in with Dawn while Justin found a place on his own. It gave Justin the space to consider his brother without any influence. He thought about the beliefs that Taylor had pushed on him over the last few years. After much consideration, Justin decided that his brother was indeed a prophet of God and that the messages from spirit were divine. If Taylor needed his help saving the world, Justin would be there for him. Taylor spent this time thinking things over as well, planning his next step on the path to destiny. None of his money-making schemes were working. His ecstasy business was moderately successful, but it was nowhere near earning the $20 million he'd estimated he'd need to execute his plan to take over the church. Taylor turned to Spirit for advice. After praying and listening, he decided that extortion and murder were the best way to raise the money he needed. He enlisted the help of his remaining loyal followers, Justin and Don. The trio moved into a three-bedroom house on the far east side of Concord on April 29, 2000. He christened the group as the Children of Thunder. The name was inspired by the biblical story of two brothers, John and James, who asked to sit at the left and right of Jesus. Jesus had called them the Sons of Thunder. In this case, Taylor would be Jesus, with Justin at his left and Dawn at his right. 
Taylor Helzer turned 30 on July 26, 2000, a miraculous sign in his mind. Jesus began preaching at age 30. Joseph Smith solidified the growing LDS at 30. Taylor decided that the Sunday after his 30th birthday was finally time. The Children of Thunder would truly begin their bloody war against Satan. Thanks again for tuning into Cults. Next week, we'll see how Taylor's delusions justified the murders of five people. We'll see how the plans unraveled, the drastic measures they took, and what led to their arrest. You can find more episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, on Spotify or your favorite podcast directory. Several of you have asked how to help us. If you enjoy the show, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound designed by Dick Schroeder with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Liebeskind. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Cults is written by David Hurst and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Hi, listeners. It's Ashley Flowers, and here's a quick reminder to check out my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, I'm taking you across the globe to look at 15 of the most notorious crimes from 15 different countries. Some stories are sure to shock, some may leave you stumped, but all are quite the trip. Follow my new series, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers. Listen for free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.